There's no free sex. It's too dangerous. Are you speaking about from an emotional standpoint or physically? Physically and socially. Well, think of consent. Okay, when can you give consent? Well, what constitutes consent? A whim? What if you change your mind? What if you're intoxicated? What if you're stoned? What if you're upset? What if you feel you've been manipulated? And consent is important. Well, what constitutes consent? Well, marriage does. So that's where sex was encapsulated fundamentally. In the 60s, the idea was that sex could be casual. Well, AIDS pretty much put the end to that idea. So, and it definitely spread as a consequence of promiscuity. That was definitely one of the driving factors that put AIDS yeah. everywhere. So that was not so good, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. The reaction on campuses is, well, what constitutes consent? And the reason that has become questionable is because it's questionable. This podcast exists because I love talking to people and I love going deep. The purpose is to plant seeds of inspiration. We enter a space of vulnerability and relatability. And what you realize is that we are so much more alike than we are different. To quote Ramdas, we're all just walking each other home. And the show is just one step. I'm Danica Patrick and I'm pretty intense. So you talk a lot about malevolence, and I've thought about it a lot. And I think about these loops and patterns and the way that we grew up. I'm, I wonder, and maybe the definition is important of, of malevolence and what you mean. Harm for harm's sake. So it's intentional. It's aware. It's not only intentional. The person who's doing it knows it's wrong. They do it anyway. So it's not by accident. This isn't the kind of patterning or things like that that drive someone to be reactive or combative, but they're really just protecting themselves because of something else going on in their psyche or in their experience. This is someone who is mean, mean to be mean. Yeah, they're out to hurt. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's like that some of the time. And some people are like that more often than others. I think one of the best... And we should talk a little bit about more about self-awareness too, because mm -hmm. we didn't quite finish that. But um, resentment can drive that, right? Mm -hmm. You get resentful. Mm -hmm. You're not getting what you want. You won't admit what you want. You feel oppressed. You feel that things aren't going your way in an unfair way. That mm -hmm. can make you want to hurt. It's very powerful motivation. Mm. And it's very unfortunate. But There's more awareness there, but is there not some level of defense there? No, there's revenge. It's more like revenge. I mean, look, that, that defensive reaction occurs. I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. So, but I wouldn't consider that malevolence. Malevolence is, I'm going to hurt you even if I hurt myself doing it. And maybe if I hurt myself doing it, so much the better. Oh, I've know. had that on the racetrack before. Oh, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Of course, of course. Well, and you know, if you want to hurt your parents, that's the right way to do it. You hurt them and yourself. And if you don't think people will do that, you just don't know anything about people. I mean, yeah. pe people will do that. And there's a deep streak of that capability within us. So, so I, I, I started to understand this a little bit in many different ways. But, you know, in, in the story of, of Adam and Eve... Adam and Eve open their eyes, right? Their eyes are open when they eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So mm. they, their eyes are open, they notice that they're naked. And that's when they learn about good and evil. I thought, why in the world? How does that make sense? Their eyes are open. They see that they're naked. That makes sense. That That's associated with vision. Why would that be associated with the knowledge of good and evil? Well, nakedness is vulnerability. You talked about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Well, Malevolence exploits vulnerability. So once I know that I'm vulnerable, I know how to hurt you. Right? I can use it. That's and I do think that's something very specific to human beings. I mean, animals hurt each other. Chimpanzees tear each other apart. But mm. human beings can be unbelievably calculated in their use of brutality. And that's because we know what hurts. We have imagination for that, and then we can use it. And it's part of being self-conscious. It's a, it's, a, it's a catastrophic consequence of being self-conscious, you could think of it mm -hmm. that way. So, because if I want to imagine how to hurt you, I just have to think, well, what would really hurt me if I was in her situation? Mm -hmm. And bang, I've got it. And I think that's, 
in some sense, it's defensive, you know, because people are often driven to resentment by suffering that they can't tolerate, can't attribute meaning to. But it, it passes a line, you know, when you start adding to it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's something that needs to be checked, and checked in all of us. Is there a reason or uh, any statistical research that shows what makes one more malevolent than another, which, or uses, uh, hurts other people more? Well, you said second, you said a um, hundred times more likely to be, what did Step you say? Step parent. Step parent. Abused, yeah. Yeah, well, alcohol does. Certainly alcohol. Really being drunk. <laughs> oh yes, I mean, alcohol. Alcohol is a very bad drug for violence. 50% of people who are murdered are drunk. And 50% of the people who murder them are drunk. And that's true for almost every violent crime. In fact, if you eliminated alcohol, you'd eliminate most interpersonal violence. Look, I, I find that this is kind of an interesting topic because I, I think it's interesting that alcohol is legal. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, you get, you, you do terrible things sometimes you probably couldn't um, you probably like, couldn't have made any uh, a worse drug legal right by, from an epidemiological yeah. perspective on the other hand you have marijuana or um uh psilocybin or uh, lsd even or some of these other drugs and they make you thirsty <laughs> make you laugh and you wake up feeling fine i find it really fascinating that alcohol is the illegal one how did that ever happen that that or is the legal one how did why does our system i think work? it probably happened because it was so easy to make and it was just everywhere so right because all you really have to do is put barley in water and you get beer right so it was really easy to make and at sure. least in many societies, it's been around for a very long time. And so it became legal just because, well, back in the Middle Ages, people drank alcohol, not water, because all the water was polluted. Right, right. Right. So so that's the reason. But it certainly wasn't a consequence of evaluating the drugs by their comparative risk and rank ordering them and making you know the least harmful legal. It wasn't that at all, because alcohol is unbelievably dangerous. I mean, about 10% of people become addicted to it in one way or another. Really? And far more people than that abuse it. Yes, at least once in their life, yes. Yeah. It's really bad. I studied alcohol for years. Uh, it was my th subject of my PhD. Um, oh, my goodness. So. Do you believe that, um, are you a fan of the legalizations that have happened with marijuana and the things that have I don't see that making them illegal has worked. And I don't think there's good evidence that legalizing them has had detrimental consequences. Right. I mean, we legalized marijuana in Canada just mm -hmm. before the pandemic. <laughs> so the marijuana stores were open through the whole bloody pandemic, weirdly enough. But I mean, in, in terms of interpersonal aggression, marijuana doesn't even register compared to alcohol as, as, as a social danger. Now, I'm not saying that it's without its harm. I mean, I've, I've had friends who I think were tilted towards psychosis because of marijuana. And there's some evidence that its use, if you're predisposed to psychosis, can can exacerbate that tendency. Now, he, he may have used it to self-medicate, so I can't say that it was necessarily the cause, but it looked to me like it wasn't good. And I saw lots of people when I was a kid for whom pot wasn't good. Mm -hmm. I saw some for whom it was good, <laughs> but many it wasn't. It, changed them a lot and not for the better as far as I was concerned. So what do you but, think uh, of the therapeutic mm -hmm. side of um, things like psilocybin and the things that MDMA psilocybin and that's its own monster. God only knows about psilocybin. I, I just no one has any idea what that is. So I don't know what to say about LSD is the same sort of thing. It's like mm -hmm. those drugs are so far beyond our comprehension that I mean, it takes almost no LSD. It's the most powerful pharmacological stu substance ever yeah. discovered. It mm -hmm. takes a couple hundred million molecules, which is really none at all, to, to put you somewhere completely else. It's, it's, it's unbelievably powerful. Those drugs, DMT, psilocybin, LSD, they're, I think they're the biggest mystery there is, as far as I can tell right now. I don't think there's anything we understand less than those drugs. Marijuana is sort of in that category because it's a mm. quasi hallucinogen, but um, it's not the same sort of thing as DMT or psilocybin or LSD, mescaline. Mm. 
Like, yeah. I mean, I know that DMT has been called like the spirit molecule, right? So, yeah, it, people regularly report, you know, encounters with other beings when they when they take DMT, much to the chagrin and shock of the people studying them. Right. So we, there's just no one has any idea how to account for it. So it's hard to account for whether or not there's a benefit or not to it. Well, th that's a different story to some degree. There was a large scale study done, population level study of hundreds of thousands of people who had either used psychedelics or who hadn't. Mm. And the ones who had used them at least once were healthier by almost every marker. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that you could attribute it to the psychedelics because there might have been other differences between the populations, but there certainly was no evidence that the psychedelic use had made those people worse. And then Roland Griffiths and his crew in, at Johns Hopkins, who are doing very careful studies of psilocybin, have showed that it's extraordinarily powerful uh, mechanism for helping people quit smoking and for overcoming their fear of death if they have cancer, which is no one, you know, why does it help them overcome their fear? Well, that's a deep mystery. That's a very, very deep mystery. So we're probably not going to figure it out today on this podcast. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think so. So on so, to a real, uh, on to a, on to a topic that we probably could at least unpack a little bit more. And I know that we've gone, I know that you've gone down this road before, but I just think that it's, you know, I'd love to ask you questions around it. And it's this, it's, it's identity politics and, uh, and how hmm. it's, it's, is it more rampant than ever? I think it's probably it's probably yes. wise to ask if it is or it isn't. Based I on think it is. Well, I don't think that it, it, it existed to speak of, except in very localized places 30 years ago. I mean, there were racial tensions, but this is a whole different, this is a whole different level of confusion. Well, you talked about this, you know, what's better and what's worse. And you said that there is- Right, right. Confusion. We didn't talk about what was worse, did we? Not as Except much. technological transformation, yeah. With technology and, and, and instability. And so mm -hmm. what, what, what a, is there, do you, are you aware of contributing factors that would lead to people having, s clomming on to a concept and to a group and, you know, just the, the way that the world is today? I mean, it seems. Well, I think, I think to some degree, people have always done that. Right. I mean, one of the purposes of your society, one of its fundamental functions is to provide you with a, an adult identity. That's what a initiation ritual does. Now, those are generally more common for men than for women because women kind of undergo their own initiation biologically. Mm. Right. I mean, there's a real marker for maturation for women. Right. 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 And it's pretty graphic. <laughs> Right. Whereas for men, it's more of a continuum. And so in many societies, the males are initiated um, and they're terrified to death. That's part of it. And then after that, they're given a cultural identity, a new adult identity. Well, in our society, part of the reason that identity politics has become so rampant, there's lots of reasons, I think, but one of them is that it isn't we have a lot of choice yeah. and it isn't obvious that that's all that good for people. How much choice do you want? Do you want to choose your gender? Mm. Are you bloody well sure you want to choose your gender? Mm -hmm. You don't think it's complicated enough just to take the one that's most likely suitable for you? Mm -hmm. Now we know that that's an ill-fitting garment. You know, there's been tomboys forever. There are feminine men and there are masculine women. And so the gender, the gender theorists are right about that. So if you look at personality, which is the right way to look at it, which is not how they look at it, because as, as scientists, they're appalling. But there is biological sex, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there is personality. Right. Okay, so a feminine personality, I can tell you what a feminine personality looks like because we've, we've published, I would say, some of the definitive studies, people from my lab on gender differences in personality. So now I hope I get this exactly right. Under extroversion, women are more enthusiastic, more positive emotion, 
And men are more assertive. They're more likely to dominate conversations. Those are both aspects of extroversion. The differences aren't huge, but that's the way they tilt. Neuroticism. To be as sensitive to negative emotion as the average woman, you have to be more sensitive to negative emotion than 80% of men if you're male. I think I've got that right. I hope I've got that right. It's one standard boat. Now it's probably, sorry, it's not that high. Sorry, that's not right. 60-40. It's 60-40. So um, I can't haul the stats up right away in my imagination at the moment. So anyways, the, uh, one of the bigger differences is in sensitivity to negative emotion. And women are more sensitive to negative emotion. Um, right. Agreeableness. Women are more agreeable than men. And the difference is about the same as it is for negative emotion. Mm -hmm. So particularly it divides into compassion and politeness. And the difference mm -hmm. is particularly marked with compassion. So, and that might also be responsible for the explosion of compassion culture-wide, hmm. right? I mean, that's what you see is right. we have to take everyone's feelings into account. Right. That's compassion. So what are women going to be like politically? Well, they're going to emphasize compassion <laughs> and perhaps they're going to emphasize safety. That's what you'd predict if you looked at the temperamental differences. Conscientiousness, men and women are pretty much the same, although women are a bit more orderly and men are a bit more industrious. Mm -hmm. Openness, pretty much the same. Women are a little bit higher in openness to experience, and so that's the aesthetic end of it, which is why they prefer literature, let's say, and men are a little higher in interest in ideas. So those are the differences between men and women. So you can have a masculine woman, she'd have all the masculine traits. Now, she'd be rarer than a masculine man by quite a large margin, but it's not so rare that that, that doesn't exist, it certainly exists. That'd be confusing to some degree because, you know, you have a female body and a masculine psychology, masculine personality. Hmm. But that, why is that a problem exactly? Right. Now, it's a problem if you can choose your body all of a sudden. Hmm. And it isn't obvious. See, the reason that I objected in many ways to what was happening in Canada years ago with the mm -hmm. transgender bill was I thought, oh, this is going to confuse far more people than it's going to help. You know, it's not like adolescents aren't confused about sex and their identity. That's what adolescence is, is confusion about sex and identity. You know, in general, what confusion happens, about everything. What do I do? Who am I? Yeah, exactly. And no <laughs> wonder, right? Because you have a lot of choices ahead of you. And, right. and it's a tumultuous time. There's a lot of neurological reorganization. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's too many choices. Well, look, there's a huge literature on consumer choice. So let's say, you, you might ask yourself, how many shampoos do you want to go look at when you're shopping? One, five, or 300? Five. Five, exactly. Why not 300? Because one of those 300 is the best. Diminishing your returns on my investment. Of That's time. for sure. That's for sure. And like, how are you going to evaluate 300 items for quality? You're just, no matter which one you pick, you've made a mistake. <laughs> you know, when you go into Subway and you say, they say, how do you want your sandwich? Like, I want you to figure that out. That's why I'm <laughs> paying for it. You know, if I have to make every sandwich decision, I might as well make it. <laughs> So, right. so people drown in choice very rapidly. Right. Talk so, about anxiety, right? Yes, exactly. Well, that is anxiety. It's terrible anxiety. And too many choices is anxiety. Hmm. So, and it isn't like, I, it's not like I know the answer to how much yeah. choice about your gender you should have. But I think that, you know, we, we need to recognize that there's wide variation in personality within women and within men, even though there are differences, and mostly men and women overlap, by the way. So we're more the same than we are different, except at the extremes, and that matters. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're low in agreeableness enough, one in a hundred, let's say, you're way more likely to be in prison. And so that's males. Mm -hmm. So there are not very many women in prison compared to men, and that's because the, at the extremes, there's a huge preponderance of aggressive men physically aggressive men, even though at the middle point, there's a lot of overlap. People don't understand this. Maybe maybe then the, the other side of the question is then, why are people so offended so easily? I think there's m more difficulty 
for each side to speak to each other, people to use the right terminology and words and not offend someone than ever too. So why are, why are people seemingly more easily offended? Are That's they? a really good question. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to say because people have been offended for a long time. The moral majority was offended for a long time in the 80s, you know, I mean, and there was plenty of censorship and that sort of thing. I, again, it's one of those things, it's very difficult to track across time. Mm -hmm. It might be that we're exposed to more things that offend us now. I mean, yeah. you go on the net, you, if you can't find something to be offended by, you're not trying right. very hard. Well, that, right. that could just be it, right? I mean, imagine that we never want to underestimate the, the impact of insane technological transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can see everything mm -hmm. all the time about anything. And so I don't know if people are more easily offended or if there's just way more offensive things. So maybe it's a matter of just reducing the amount of options, reducing exposure. I mean, is this a remedy for clarity, for less um, volatility, less offensive, less, less chance to be offended? Well, who knows, right? I mean, Twitter seems to be a good way of being offended um, continually. And offending. <laughs> and offending, yeah. And, you know, that might be a consequence of its structure. It's limited. It's, it makes, it seems to reward impulsivity. It seems to transmit bad better than good mm -hmm. quite rapidly. We don't know what these technologies do to people or to communication. Mm. Um, maybe, so I don't know if people are more easily offended than they used to be. They're offended about different things. More things. Because yeah. there's more things. Yeah, possibly, possibly. I mean, it's been interesting to see what's happened with, with sex over the course of my lifetime. I mean, in the 60s, there was this idea, and it was probably the consequence of the birth control pill, that, well, maybe sex is, is free, right? It's free and easy. It, because, well, now pregnancy wasn't necessarily a consequence, and venereal disease was reasonably well under control, and so wasn't a blatant threat, certainly not a fatal one. Mm. And so people thought, well, hmm. why not free love? Hmm. Well, I hmm. think the reason for that is it's complete rubbish. There's no free sex. It's too dangerous. And so, so what's happened is that- From an emotional standpoint? Are you speaking about from an emotional standpoint or physically? Physically and socially. Well, think of consent. Okay, when can you give consent? Well, You're the answer what is age? we don't know. No, or under like what, what conditions? Well, what constitutes consent? Exactly. A whim? Yes. What if you change your mind? What if you're intoxicated? What if you're stoned? What if you're upset? Mm -hmm. What if you feel you've been manipulated? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because the issue of consent is not, if the act is serious, and you can debate about whether or not that is, and people have their differences of opinion, it's certainly emotionally significant in all likelihood. So if it's significant, well, then consent is important. Well, what constitutes consent? Well, marriage does. So that's where sex was encapsulated fundamentally because the consent was never an issue. I mean, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of things that weren't an issue because of that. And it wasn't like it was a magical solution to everything. But so, you know, because in the 60s, the idea was that sex could be casual. Well, AIDS pretty much put the end to that idea, at least in part, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it definitely spread as a consequence of promiscuity. That was definitely one of the driving factors that sure. put AIDS everywhere. So that was not so good, to put it mildly. And then the reaction on campuses is, well, what constitutes consent? And the reason that has become questionable is because it's questionable. Unless it's not serious, but mm. you know, mm, mm. I don't think that people really believe that. Mm. So they might wish they believed it, but there's plenty of emotional damage mm. done as a consequence of too quick intimacy. I think that's generally the case because in a partnership, that becomes intimate, there's usually one person who's more emotionally invested than the other. Probably almost, almost inevitably, yes. I mean, I think inevitably in every situation. Well, pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah.
pretty much. They can still be very high, but someone's still going to be more than the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. kind of leads to the, the, the conversation about individuality being the way out of ideological traps. And, and the question is, how, how and what are the ways to know who you are? Because I don't think that's, I don't think it's as easy as it sounds. Like, who it's are you? It's impossible. People are really complicated. Yeah. You're way more complicated than anything else except <laughs> another person, right? You're the most complicated thing that exists. Then put two complicated people together and... Yeah, well, you know, hopefully they can help each other sort themselves out, at least to some degree. But yeah, I mean, you're, you, to be self-aware completely is just not possible because, mm -hmm. you know, what we try to do to understand ourselves is limit what we'll do. And you do that to other people too. You say, well, I know you. And then you punish them if they do things you don't understand. And that way they stay in the box you put them in. And there's downside to that and an upside. You know, It's part of the social contract not to do outrageous things, although you could. So we all abide by these rules and that simplifies us a lot. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's part of being polite is... You don't want the bank teller to be complex. You want them to be polite and simple. Mm -hmm. So your limited understanding is sufficient. And we do that with each other all the time, except when we're emotional. How do you find the individuality, your uniqueness, your specialness? Well, that probably manifests itself to a large degree in what you're interested in. Which is difficult yeah. to know. I, I think that's also difficult to know. I felt like it took into my mid-30s before I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm really interested in these things. Mm -hmm. Were you interested in all sorts of things? Sure. Yeah. yeah. When I was young, I did all sports. I, you know, then be, was a teenager. But it wasn't until I was really in my 30s that I really, really realized how much I enjoyed art, how much I enjoyed, you know, creating and artistic things, how much I enjoyed nature, how much I enjoyed traveling in uh, alone time, because I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, so it wasn't until I was in my mid 30s till I figured that out. So to me, that creates some of my individuality. That's my that's that's who I am. But how do people how do people figure that out so that they know who they are so they don't fall into ideological traps? Well, so the first question is, is knowing yourself the way out of an ideological trap? Well, it is to some degree because one size doesn't fit all, right? So you have to be aware of how you differ. Mm -hmm. And I, that does take a long time to figure out who you are because you're complicated. Mm -hmm. So it might not be that surprising at all that it took you till your mid-30s before you started to have some sense of who you really were because it's mm -hmm. people are very hard to understand. It's... And we don't have a good vocabulary, generally speaking, for analyzing differences in people. I mean, the, the personality test I described is a step in that direction, mm -hmm. and, but it's that lexicon, that vocabulary still isn't popularly established, let's say. So it isn't part of the conversations mm -hmm. we have about other people, except accidentally. Um, mm -hmm. I produced this other mm -hmm. technology at self-authoring that helps people write about their past, analyze their faults and their virtues, and write a plan for the future. It's yeah. a useful way of figuring out who you are. You kind of have to hit yourself against the world, but you know, you tell the story about your past and that, that helps you understand where you came from. You figure out your virtues and your faults, that sort of helps you understand your strengths and weaknesses. And then a plan gives you a course for the future it's hard to do all that writing, but it's hard to blunder through life too without a plan. So it's hard either way. Pick your hard. So, you always talk about that. Choose your, choose, choose the difficult to the difficult to choose you eventually. And you might not like it as much, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. when it's necessary, like I wouldn't say to go, to go out of your way necessarily to make your life difficult, but if you have a difficult choice in front of you and it's either abandon what you're, you know, you should be doing or do the difficult thing. Well, mm -hmm. You're going to pay a price for abandonment. So, and I guess I would also say that to, uh, to understand yourself, it's quite useful to try to not lie as you tangle yourself up in your own lies. People think they can get away with lying, but we, you can't get away with falsifying the structure of the world. You're going to pay for it. I've never seen anybody get away with anything. 
in my clinical practice. No, something, the other shoe always dropped. Always, always. And unsurprisingly, if you drop a weight on your head, above your head, like it's fine until it hits you. Yeah. But then there's changing your mind. Yeah, there you can be wrong. That's different. That's a good point, though. It's difficult to dissociate ignorance from, from lying. But, you know, you get punished when you're wrong often. But that's different, you know. It's... It's not like it's nothing to be ignorant, to be wrong. It's still hard on you. But it's a different kind of hard to be willfully wrong when you know better. Are there things that you believe differently today than you did 10, 20, 30 years ago or when you were young? Oh, God, yes. Almost everything. Almost yeah, everything? Almost everything. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the most recent thing then? Well, I probably learned in the last couple of years that I should have had a broader range of interests, simple interests, because almost everything I did was really complicated. So then when I got ill, I, I couldn't do anything because everything I did was complicated. Huh. Wow. So, so you wrote this that book, was a problem. you wrote, you wrote a lot of you, your latest book beyond order while you were while you were sick, right? Yes. Was that hard? Yes. <laughs> yes, it wasn't as hard as not doing it, though. Ah. Right? Because Did it bring you, you need joy? things to keep you going. Did it bring no. you a certain level of joy to do it? No, nothing was bringing me joy. Mm. But it brought significance. It was meaningful. So mm. that was useful. But so, what simple yes. things do you like doing now? Oh, I don't know if I still can do it. I play <laughs> ping pong with my son. That's good. I like doing that. But no, I'm not good at it. So I've walked a lot this year. Yeah. I, I, miles a day. I relate. But I don't like doing simple things either. I, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm all about deep diving. And if the conversation is surface level, it's not very interesting to me. I'd rather just sit at home mm -hmm. alone. I'd rather watch YouTube videos of you or somebody else who's talking about something that I'm interested in than, mm -hmm. than doing something. Um, so, so that's openness. That's, that's the intellect end of openness, the interest in ideas. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely a personality characteristic and can be a profound one. So being sick really stole the thing that is the most meaningful and joyful for you, or one of them. Yes, yes. Well, it... And it I, what I really depended on during that time was my family and my friends. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd always, always regarded them as important, but that was redoubled during those times. Yeah. yeah. During this time, for that matter. Mm. What has been your biggest trade-off for the work that you do? Privacy. And, uh, well, just too much exposure. And, I mean, it's funny because I'm doing podcasts, so I'm still exposing myself, so to speak. Um, but in some sense, that's just become the way it is. It's the alternative to what I was doing. I was working as a university professor, which I'm not doing anymore. So, you know, I have to do something. And so this is what I'm doing. And it's not like, I mean, I find it very meaningful, but there's this level of exposure that's beyond comprehension, really, permanently beyond comprehension. So, yeah, it's forever for the rest of your life like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and people have been very good to me, so there's that to be grateful for. But I believe in everything having its 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 ends, its polarities, and for the people that you resonate with, I'm one of them. Why? Why do I? Why do you resonate for me? Yeah, I was going to ask you that question oh. too because I was looking at my YouTube stats again the other day, and like it's still overwhelmingly male. Oh, and so, well, I, I mean, maybe, YouTube skews male, eh? so there's that. But maybe because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a masculine, masculine woman, right? Like maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Could there be some sort of personality dynamic? But I like how you have your beliefs and you stand behind them. I respect your uh, your intelligence and your um, and your depth of knowledge and research to back it up. Like for me, that's not something I'm as good at. So I love when someone's done their research and they have, they believe in what they're talking about, not only in their heart, but in their mind. 
And I, I love, I mean, in general, the, the message of sovereignty and individuality and um, responsibility, I think, is an incredible message. Yeah, the responsibility element has been well received by people. And I think maybe that's because that message isn't being delivered as effectively as it should be. The idea that meaning, meaning is to be found in responsibility. Yeah, you're saying it hasn't which, been which developed. Are, you say you're saying it hasn't been it hasn't been promoted as much. Well, yeah. there's so much of an emphasis on rights. I mean, imagine our, what if our con, if our culture was as dominated by discussion of responsibility as it was dominated by discussion of rights. Yeah, right. Being completely. I mean, that's just not how it is at all. Right. And that's strange because your rights, in some sense, are my responsibility, and vice versa. So. Right, because your accorded rights, it's distance from other people in some sense. And for them, it's the same. And so you can't have one discussion without the other. Mm -hmm. but, we, but our discussion has been very one-sided. And I think that's hard on people because it's about what you're owed. Yeah. And it isn't obvious to me that, I don't know, it doesn't, it isn't, it's not like not getting what you're owed isn't annoying. It, it is if you feel that that an injustice has right. been committed, but right. it isn't obvious to me that people find the deepest meaning in their life in getting what they're owed. I really do think that people find more significance in their life in being of ut use, utility and service to other people. That's how it looks to me. So, and often that's discussed in a sort of should way, you know, you should be good to other people. It's like, well, your life is better if you do that. That's a different way of putting it. Mm -hmm. And you can get people to think about that. It's like, well, remember those times when you were, when people were particularly happy with something that you did, something for them. How did you feel about that? Well, you can figure that out for yourself. Maybe it didn't matter, but probably it mattered. Probably you'd like to have that happen a lot more. But I think even so, more so the feeling that you get when you have a responsibility and you deliver on it. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, that feels even more meaningful that you uphold your end of the bargain, that you make someone's life better. That feels even better than when someone says, thank you for that. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. like, right, right, right. No, absolutely. No, I wasn't thinking so much about the consequences of the thanks. Yeah. That's just an indication that you yeah. did something, you know, that was that was productive and useful and right. and and caring, let's say. And yeah, I, I and I think people know that too, that when they're operating properly, that's, well, parents find tremendous meaning in in the service they provide to their children, sure. obviously. And I think you find that within a relationship, what you give, I mean, there's it's reciprocal, obviously, there has to be reciprocity, but, but it's better to concentrate at least half the time on what you're giving. Right. So perhaps if, more than that. If we were to, I might use a silly example just to like build it out, but I really want to, I really want to know what would the world look like if your work was done, but maybe in a, in a visual way, if you were, if we were to like build, build, let's just call it a commune or let's start over with the world, but the commune seems like much more accessible from a thought standpoint, because we could build one of those. What would that look like? Like, how would we create that environment to, uh, encourage such a high level of harmony and balance that the system operates smooth and well and everyone is happy like you to say happy it just happens like how do we get how do we have happy happen more often well when when we tried to solve that problem practically that's when we came up with the writing exercises that i described yeah. it's like mm -hmm. i don't think that young people in especially in later days in well in junior high high school maybe even earlier than that are taught enough to think about what they want and how they would go about getting it and i mean what they want in a deep sense like how their friendships could be better how their relationships with their parents could be better how their life could be better yeah. practically speaking so we tried to design a program 
to help younger people do the self-authoring program, but my health interfered with that and it, it fell by the wayside, unfortunately, but it's helpful for people to take stock of themselves and to chart a course. And I don't think our education system does a very good job of helping people develop a, a vision of themselves, a story for themselves. And it, it's a problem because it also means that they're not ennobled or encouraged the way they should be. And I've seen this all constantly during my lectures that people are so happy to be encouraged. They're often met with skepticism instead. And I think that's part of the problem with what's happening in our culture politically too, is that, you know, there's this terrible critique of our culture that it's all its institutions are fundamentally predicated on arbitrary power, the exercise of arbitrary power. And that implies that the ambitions of people who wish to join that culture and to thrive are expressions of tyrannical, oppressive, arbitrary power. It's very demoralizing to young people. Mm. And I don't believe it's true because I don't think the fundamental motivation is to exploit others. Mm. I think that people who do that fail, generally speaking, uh, often precipitously, societies that organize themselves around that principle are miserable and collapse. It's full, they're, they're full of deceit and backstabbing and distrust. It's hell. And so I think that people are, young people are best encouraged. And that means that you actually have to, you have to sort of like them. Like you're a mentor. It's like, I'm really on your, I'm the, on the side of the good in you and I hope it manifests itself. And I think that's what trust is for, by the way. Mm. You know, you should trust other people. Why? They can bite. Why would you trust them? Well, because it's courageous to. And that way you elicit the best from them. At least that's the best opportunity you have. You're going to get hurt sometime. You're going to get hurt distrusting too. But societies without trust are hell on earth. So trusting that's for, that's for sure. next generation though starts with you having it in the first place, right? That's sort of passing along those patterns is if I don't trust anyone, I'm going to instill that in my child. Like well, yeah. the world's not to be well, trusted. You can, you, well, you can try to change that, you know, and if you know that trust is courage, that can help because while trust can be just naivety, I trust you because I'm too foolish to know the difference. You know, I've never been hurt. I've never encountered someone malevolent. So I'm naive and I, I trust. That's not trust. That's blind faith in an environment that's been too benevolent for your own good. But trust, that's more like, well, we'll think the best of you to begin with and see what happens. And then if you make a mistake, well, We'll deal with that and we'll go back to trust. And those are stable negotiating strategies. And so that's young people need to be confronted with that and then they need to be helped to chart their course. And that's hard, you know, it takes a fair bit of individual attention because people are so complicated, but. Well, I think uh, what's interesting is how, and I think this is beautiful, how it's it's an inside job. Like it's the, it's what's going on inside of you that creates the vi environment around you. Like when I said, build the, build the commune, mm -hmm. you didn't talk about the school. You didn't talk about government. You didn't talk about outside structures. You talked about your own. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's another thing that we could talk about too. It's like one of the real advantages. I think a lot of the current political movements are quasi religions essentially and religious structures have collapsed very badly. And so these things arise to take their place because we need a religious structure because that's what provides us with our fundamental story. The fundamental story of life is a religious story by definition. That's, that's what I mean by that is the most fundamental story you have is the closest thing you have to a religion. So we started there. I mean, we started with the stories. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and metaphysics be damned, but, you know, I don't know what the fundamental significance of consciousness is, so, and neither does anybody else. So there's plenty of room for metaphysical speculation. It's hard to know what each person's destiny is. But in any case, the problem with so many ideological stories is that they give you an easy enemy. 
And that's extremely dangerous. And maybe the enemy, they always give you an enemy. Yeah, that's a real problem. So is, no, is that, that seems so like one of the biggest problems is there's always an enemy. Well, the biggest problem is the enemy isn't you. You're your worst enemy. I and agree. That's the right place to start. And so, you know, one of the advantages, I think, of Christianity, although I don't think it's limited to Christianity, is that it insists that that's the battleground. You. Right. And so if you, if you need an enemy, and maybe you do, look within. And what's the alternative? Well, to identify someone else as the enemy. And so what does that leave you with? You're all good. Nothing you do is wrong. Even if you go after them, well, maybe you should go after them. Well, we know where that ends up. I think that's the so, pattern. I think that's that's the human, that's like the human pattern. The human pattern might be that if you don't go after the enemy within, you go after the enemy without. It's possible that that's how we're, how we're structured. And it takes a it's long possible. time to have the bravery to go after the one within. Yeah, well, the monsters in there are pretty large. So... Yeah. And they definitely. do get bigger. I love the analogy when you talk about slay the dragon when it's young and <laughs> little, right? And don't let that dragon become huge and a huge problem. And it's going to be a lot harder to slay that. And then maybe first before that, even a lot harder to even just want to face it. Yeah. Well, you know, conflict avoided tends to multiply. Not always. Sometimes it's better to shut up. I mean, my wife and I had a rule. We tried to abide by it. The first time something happens that you don't like, you don't say anything. The second time it happens, you notice. The third time, you bring up all three times. Well, then you have the facts in order, and you're not always, you're not always flying off at the handle. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, well, it, it worked when we were able to implement it. And then? <laughs> well, then we try to settle it try to negotiate a solution so that we were both content with, try to solve the problem. That often meant a fair bit of digging, painful digging often, you know, because God only knows why you make mistakes, and especially repeatedly. Agreed. I mean, I'm, I've unpacked stuff from being a child, like, you know, five, 10 years old, probably before that even. Mm -hmm. And that's to me where I've found I've been able to unlock my own patterns as being able to get that deep. But man, it is a it is a maze to get there. I mean, it's right there, but it is like it might as well be on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, and you often don't want to figure it out either because it's painful. So if you have the three rule, if those are the rules for the relationship, if the, what would be, oh, you know, three rules, three rules. I know you have 12 rules twice. <laughs> I know you have 24 <laughs> rules. But if you were to pick, you know, three rules for life that would lead you down a better path, what would they be? Well, I think not saying things you know to be untrue. That's a good thing. Don't lie. That's good. Be grateful. And then... Try to work for the best in yourself and other people. And maybe even broader than that, try to work for the best, despite your cynicism and resentment. I suppose that's a form of gratitude as well. That's what love means fundamentally, is working for the best of things. And that's a, it's a, it's a goal. I mean, what's the alternative? Hate? And that's not gonna make things better, it's gonna make things worse. Oh you know, generally speaking. So something like truth nested inside of love. Then there's gratitude lurking around the edges. Beauty is important. More art, right? Yeah, well, more beauty, period. Everywhere, that would be nice. It's kind of intimidating, beauty. What do you mean? But, what do you mean by that? Well, because it's an ideal. It judges you. Everything, I, this is something that's quite interesting. Is every ideal is a judge, right? Because By you nature. fall short of it. Yeah, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting problem that you need an ideal to work towards, but the consequence of that is that 
you're judged by it. That's fascinating because we always want mm -hmm. the ideal, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I recommend it to people that they try to reward themselves for improving over who they were yesterday, rather than punishing themselves from their deviation for their deviation from the ideal. Look for incremental improvements and let yourself know that you've managed them. Is it important to hold the ideal, but also then keep short-term goals of yes, you definitely. against yourself? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You want to break it down into, and then you do this with kids too. You want to set someone a task that will stretch them beyond their limit, but not be impossible. Right? So that's, and you, that's, that's part of being intelligent and careful within a relationship. Because you'd, it'd be nice to facilitate success. I mean, maybe it has to be punctuated by failure from time to time, but that's one of the things you do as a therapist is try to set things up so that people succeed in moving towards their goals and try to make the tasks small enough so that they're a reasonable probability that they will be completed successfully. I think that everyone should have a therapist. So, uh, Jordan, thank you so much for your time. And I have all your books. And um, you're brilliant, and I'm super grateful for this time. Yes, well, thank you very much for talking to me. It's very good of you to take the time. Can't wait for further books. And oh, It was really nice talking to you and to all the people that are listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.